We now return with TLC's Einstein's Universe on Science Frontiers. Speed up, you see that they seem to be twisted towards you. Indeed, as your speed increases closer and closer to the speed of light, you start seeing the far sides of the building and truck. You seem to be seeing right around the corners. It's like walking through a rainstorm when your front gets wet and your back stays dry. The light approaches you from unexpected directions. Consider two bicycles coming at each other at close to the speed of light. You might think that their combined speed, the rate at which they are coming together, is faster than light. But from each rider's point of view, it's not like that at all. Their combined speed, as they measure it, always remains less than the speed of light. Einstein launched his disconcerting ideas from very simple premises. The riders demonstrated why time runs slowly in a fast-moving vehicle. They just rode in company and threw a ball to represent a signal, a, a flash of light. From their point of view, the light went straight across between them. But from our point of view, as onlookers watching the bikes go by, the signal went obliquely and on a longer path. But light always moves at the same speed, so that the time it takes for the signal to go from there to here takes longer from our point of view than from the point of view of the riders. So Einstein tells us that their clocks in the moving frame move slower than ours in exactly proportion of this line to this line. High speed travel also makes you seem heavier. Time for a rapidly moving bike slows down and it accelerates more sluggishly Mass means resistance to acceleration, and the bike's mass piles on as it gets near the speed of light. In fact, it continues to grow more massive without limit as it gets very close to the speed of light, so that, in fact, it never can go faster than light. But from the point of view of the rider, his mass seems the same as usual. When Einstein realized just how much the way things look depend on where you stand, he also saw a danger. Because, he reasoned, the laws of physics must be the same for the rider as for the fixed observer. Special relativity was born brilliantly out of that requirement. But the price Einstein exacted from us was the scrapping of the old ideas about time. Einstein realized that although each person's view of events is a little different... Laws was Einstein's old obsession. The speed of light remaining constant amid all the commotion of the cosmos. Now, because of its motion in orbit around the sun, our Earth is traveling at a speed of about 30 kilometers a second. If the principle of relativity were not valid, we should expect the laws of nature to depend on the Earth's direction of motion at any moment. But the most careful observations have never revealed any lack of equivalence of different directions. This is a very powerful argument in favor of the principle of relativity. But Einstein's revelation shook the planet. From the reasoning of special relativity emerged a law of creation and destruction. Einstein's universe will continue on TLC's Science Frontiers. Now return with TLC's Einstein's universe on Science Frontiers. It was time for us to consider the realm of the atom where relativistic events are more usual than on the roads of Texas. Of course, for, for real motorcycles, the velocities are much too low for the effects of relativity to be noticeable. <laughs> Even uh, for the spacecraft circling the Earth every 90 minutes, the uh, speeds are too low. 
they, they move. In fact, it's about 140,000th the speed of light, and uh, their increase in mass due to motion is less than one part in a thousand million. Astronomers looking at distant stars and distant objects are seeing systems moving with a substantial fraction of the velocity of light. And when we enter the atomic realm, we uh, enter into an uh, area where the relativistic effects are very noticeable. Even on your television screen, the electrons that paint the television screen are moving with uh, perhaps 20 to 30 percent of the velocity of light, and uh, thereby their mass is increased to the order of a percent or so. Out at uh, Stanford at the Linear Accelerator Center, we produce the highest energy electrons in the world. They uh, come so close to the speed of light that their mass is increased by a factor of 40,000 compared to what they started with. As a result of this very high velocity and high energy that they acquire, their clocks are slowed down. And they don't realize that they have moved the full two mile of our accelerator. In fact, from the electron's point of view, their clocks are moving so slowly, they think they have gone only two and a half feet by the time they come to the end of the accelerator. At the end of the accelerator, we also have a storage ring, so-called spear ring, where we smash the particles into one another. We create new matter. And in this way, we can very accurately measure the conversion of energy of motion into matter and into mass. And in this way, confirm with great accuracy the Einstein equation, E equal mc squared. What an equation that is. It looks so innocent. E, energy, m, mass, and c, not the speed of light, but the square of the speed of light, an enormous number, so that a little mass is worth a lot of energy. It's hard to appreciate what an enormous leap of intuition and imagination it took to come to this simple formula. Einstein had been thinking from the age of 16 to 26 consistently about the nature of light and electromagnetic radiation. And almost as a byproduct of his, of his uh, thinking on this subject, he came to the following conclusion. That if you look at light, say, from the sun, and if you were moving towards the sun, as we've already discussed, the light would become bluer. Now, the blue light has more energy than the white light we normally see. And therefore, he reasoned, there must be more energy apparently coming from the sun. But if that energy is not drawn from any change in the motion of the sun, it must mean that that energy is coming from the mass itself. And so he concluded that the mass of the sun itself is converted directly into energy. He then made the enormous leap to, to generalize this result to all forms of energy. In the 19th century, there had been energy of motion, and energy of light, energy of heat, but not interconvertible. And so he came to the startling conclusion that all mass and all energy are, in fact, equivalent. We are led to the more general conclusion that the mass of an object is a measure of its energy content. It is not impossible that with materials whose energy content is variable to a high degree, for example, with uh, radium salt, the theory may be successfully put to the test. What Einstein is noting here is that the energy release in nuclear reactions is so great that there is actually a measurable change in the mass that can be uh, detected and his formula can be verified. The uh, nuclear burning together with the Einstein relation E equal mc squared solve a long-standing riddle, namely, how is it that the stars, the sun, can burn for billions of years without running out of uh, material? This equation, E equal mc squared and the efficiency of nuclear burning, were tested quantitatively in 1932 by Cockroft and Walton with their accelerator, who verified it for the first time. But it was a long time before any practical use was made of it. Einstein was hounded out of Germany. He came to Princeton, 
where I had the pleasure of seeing him after his arrival. But it was five years from that till that fateful day when I went down to the pier in New York and the ship came in with Niels Bohr and the word of the discovery of the fission of uranium. January 16th, 1939, and not long after that, Einstein wrote that fateful letter to Roosevelt with all its consequences. Hmm. Extremely powerful bombs of a new type may thus be constructed. I understand that Germany has actually stopped the sale of uranium from the Czechoslovakian mines. And it was hardly 200 miles from here across the desert that that first dramatic explosion took place that brought us into the true atomic era. Einstein, who set it all in train, was appalled by the nuclear arms race. It's ironic that this humble, gentle man who had been an avowed pacifist should now be etched in the history of mankind as the father of nuclear weapons. He believed, as do many today, including many scientists who are familiar with the devastating effects of these weapons, that survival in the world with nuclear weapons is one of the great challenges of our generation. It was, I believe, his last official act to s endorse a manifesto in 1955 with uh, Bertrand Russell, which I believe you have here. Yes. We appeal to you as human beings, to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to a new paradise. If you cannot, there lies before you the risk of universal death. I think in talking about Einstein's great achievement, we should really stress the fact that it lies at the basis of all life. The nuclear weapons are only a small byproduct of uh, human folly. Even when I strike this match, a minute amount of the mass is converted into energy. If I took all the mass in this match and converted it into free energy. There's enough energy here to lift the entire mountain on which we're sitting now about 10 feet off the ground. This energy plays a role in the hum of a violin, in the growing plants here, and in fact in the expansion of the universe. Einstein's universe will continue on TLC's Science Frontiers. We now return with TLC's Einstein's universe on Science Frontiers. All of astrophysics is about nature's attempt to release the energy hidden in ordinary matter. The energy defined by the equation E equals mc squared. So I learned to perceive the sun, hot enough in Texas, as a natural nuclear furnace and a typical star. Energy can create matter, so matter has hidden energy. Falling down, like the apple, can liberate some of it. So Wallace Sargent led me back to gravity, saying it can overwhelm a star. When the sun grows old, it will first of all become a red giant in which it becomes much bigger and a little cooler than it is now. At this time, the Earth will be consumed, but fortunately, it will not happen for several more billion years. After that, the sun will shrink and become a white dwarf, which is about the size of the Earth. During this time, a lot of hidden energy will be released, but not as much as has been released by nuclear burning at earlier stages of its evolution. Stars much more massive than the Sun end their lives as supernovae. That is, they undergo gigantic explosions. During this event, the inner parts of the star is driven inwards in an enormous implosion. This forms a neutron star, which in turn becomes a pulsar. The matter in the neutron star is extraordinarily dense, and the atoms are crushed together, and a substantial fraction of the hidden energy originally in the star is set free. 
for some neutron stars exist. But theoretical calculations tell us that something of, say, three times the mass of the sun can't exist as a neutron star. It's really only a short step from a neutron star to matter being crushed by implosion into a black hole. In the case of a collapsed star ten times the sun's mass, say, the resulting black hole would be only about 40 miles across. Nothing could escape from it, not even light. Material falling into such a black hole would liberate tremendous energy just before disappearing into the hole, giving out intense x-rays. And these x-rays could be seen from the Earth and that's, in fact, how we could expect to detect such a thing. Well, the X-ray source called Cygnus X1 meets these specifications and may well be a black hole, and it's sucking material, apparently, from a companion supergiant star. Now we're on Cygnus X1. What we, we, what we can actually see here is the companion to the star, uh, not the black hole itself. The black hole is orbiting around the star that you can see. This is the, a record of the X-ray emissions from Cygnus X1. And you see there's no regularity in it, as there would be if it were a neutron star. No, they're not, they're not very regular, are they? The quest for black holes was, for me, the culminating proof that Einstein's theories still inspire the very latest research. It led us to distant galaxies of stars, as big as our own Milky Way, but erupting most violently. In order to explain many of the phenomena out there in the universe, uh, we have to invoke enormous energy sources. Um, and it looks more and more as though black holes may be the only possibility to provide such large sources of energy. In this kind of theory, an enormous black hole with a mass probably several billion times the mass of the sun, sits at the center of the galaxy and releases energy in some way which we don't yet understand by swallowing entire stars and gas from the surrounding galaxy. For the past couple of years, several of us have been paying particular attention to the galaxy M87. It's a very distinctive galaxy with a jet of luminous matter poking out at one side. M87 is a strong source of radio waves and also X-rays. And altogether, it's a very energetic galaxy. Most of the work that we've done has been observations at the Kitt Peak Observatory in Arizona and at Palomar Observatory in California. We've used a very sensitive light detector brought out from London by Alec Boxenberg. What we do is to look at slices of M87 at different distances from the center and use the Doppler shift to tell how fast the stars in the galaxy are moving around. What we find is that the stars in the very center of M87 are moving around much more rapidly than we would expect. As far as we can see, they're moving fast because they're orbiting around an invisible object. And we can use the speeds of the stars to estimate the mass of this invisible object. It turns out to be about 5,000 million times as big as the sun, just about the kind of mass that we would expect for a black hole if it really is powering all the phenomena that we see in M87. The problem is that the volume you, you'd expect for a black hole of the, uh, of the mass that we think the one in M87 has is very small indeed. And so, really, the problem is to try and resolve much smaller angular distances. Small, angular distances. I suppose that's the penny at a distance of a mile again. In order to try and do this, I've turned radio astronomer and with colleagues used the radio telescopes at Goldstone in California and at Madrid in Spain, 5,000 miles away. The object is to try and get a telescope as large as the Earth, by means of which you can resolve very small distances. Well, I'd just like to know at this juncture, to what extent is all this a logical consequence of Einstein's work, or has it already taken off on its own? Well, it was certainly not known to Einstein that black holes would be a consequence of his work. On the other hand, later work, since Einstein died, in fact, has pointed very clearly to the fact that within his theory, at least, in, within general relativity, one. This, this is a very clear prediction of the theory. 
And of course, independent of the, uh, the actual nature of the underlying object, we know that it has to put out a great deal of energy because we see that directly, and that implies a huge underlying mass from E equals mc squared. And of course, the light that we get directly from the uh, object as analyzed by Wall Sargent obeys the Doppler effect and, uh, and comes to us as photons. So the richness of Einstein's ideas bears, bears on the entire range of actual observations of these objects. A computer charted the fathomless warp of space in an imagined collision between two black holes. Our ancestors frightened themselves with dragons and hobgoblins. We have jaws and black holes. In fact, at the dead center of a black hole, I found that even Einstein's ideas falter. Theory of general relativity can now be adequately applied to the black hole itself and certain distance in. But it's possible to show that even the theory itself predicts its own downfall. And this is one of the things which was not appreciated uh, before Einstein died. Mm. But certainly, everything does get compressed into a very, very small region. And there comes a point somewhere where new physics has to come in. The argument really is at what point and what new physics comes in. Of course, when you're at states of very high density, you can no longer deal with gravitation in isolation of all the other forces of matter, the strong nuclear forces, the weak forces of radioactive decay, and the electromagnetic forces. Nor can you stay strictly within the realm of classical physics and ignore the quantum ideas. Absolutely it's right. It's ironic that Einstein, who was a founder of the quantum theory through his discovery of the quantum or the photon, which is the particle of light, never felt comfortable, never felt satisfied with that theory because of the element of uncertainty and the element of chance that it brings into a description of the behavior of particles. Apprehending more than I could possibly comprehend, I listened like a child allowed to stay up late to ideas that might surpass Einstein's. On a theoretical frontier, I might say that it seems to me we're no closer to knowing where we're going. They're the very beginnings of efforts to make a supergravity theory, a quantum theory that embraces gravity and the other forces of matter all unified together in this great dream of the grand synthesis that Einstein spent 30 years, in his last 30 years of his life, trying to create and failed. That, that alone is a measure, a statement of how difficult the problem is. When you get down to the size of an elementary particle, the question is, does the concept of space and time still apply at a smaller scale than this? And I think most physicists would take the view that it does apply and that it goes on until you're down to a tiny fraction of the size of a particle. But the sort of line that we're following is one which suggests that perhaps things go wrong before that. And the idea is that the, point, the concept of a point in space is not the primary concept. This is only a mathematical artifact and that something a little closer to the idea of a particle, although not actually a particle, it's a thing that we call a twister, which is, um, well, it's something I couldn't explain in detail, but the, the idea is that the concept of a particle and of space itself are both things which emerge out of this more primitive concept. And this is the line we've been pursuing for many years now. And uh, one of the great problems is to see how to tie it in with general relativity in, in, a, in a very clear way, and there are some encouraging features, but it's not certainly not finished yet. Einstein's universe will continue on TLC's Science Frontiers. We now return with TLC's Einstein's universe on Science Frontiers. From the minutest quantities of space to the immensities of the universe. The director recognized the little boy in me, and he let me drive the big telescope across the sky. Great. Beautiful, isn't it? Yes, that's fantastic. Yes. 
The rings of Saturn mapped for me the warped space surrounding the giant planet. As I scanned the Milky Way, Harlan Smith reminded me that the stars, billions of them, and including the Sun, all circle under their mutual gravity. And we look beyond our own galaxy to similar whirlpools of stars far away in space-time. To sample a few of the billions of galaxies prepared me for contemplating the whole of Einstein's universe and its presumed origin in the Big Bang. And it was brought home to me how Einstein's discoveries about space and time, light and matter, all connect and make a girdle for the universe. Could we pull Einstein's ideas all together? Energy has mass, and mass has energy. And the mass of the sun, so gigantic, has only to be burned up a little at a time to provide us with all the heat and light and power that we see here on Earth. But that mass has more gravitational pull that pulls light, bends it, pulls other stars. And when stars start flying apart in the earliest days of the universe, that gravitational pull slows down their outward flight. The universe comes into being out of nothingness. Matter, light, energy, all at once. And this matter, this light, and this energy all expand, get more dilute, contract into stars, galaxies, planets. And the whole thing goes on expanding, getting bigger, farther apart. And that's the phase we live in now, as these galaxies are flying apart from each other. But then comes the moment, we believe, down the line, when they stop flying apart, their gravitational attraction pulls them back together again. The whole thing contracts, energies go up once more, we get to a gigantic big crunch. In its pristine form 60 years ago, general relativity clearly required the Big Bang for the birth of the universe. But that melodramatic story conflicted with the astronomy of the day and Einstein doctored his equations to describe a more restful universe. In order to arrive at this consistent view, we admittedly had to introduce an extension of the field equations of gravitation, which is not justified by our actual knowledge of gravitation. The introduction of that cosmological term was the biggest blunder I ever made. Death alone can save one from making blunders. In fairness to Einstein, just about the time that he made this remark, astronomers' idea of the universe were changing rapidly. It was discovered about that time that not only was there our Milky Way galaxy, but there were billions of other galaxies in the universe as well. And more surprisingly, it was found that they were rushing away from one another at enormous speeds. Um, this was discovered by means of the redshift that occurs in the spectrum of the light due to the Doppler shift when things are moving away from us. Mm. I'm using this particular machine to measure the redshift of the galaxy. This is the galaxy, and this is the spectrum of the galaxy and of a nearby object which has no redshift at all. When I change the magnification, here is a spectral line due to sodium. And in the distant galaxy, the spectrum line is shifted towards the red. And from the separation of the two lines, one can tell that roughly the redshift is about 7,000 kilometers per second. This is one of the most important kinds of measurements that astronomers make. We make, often make redshift measurements. It was first discovered about 50 years ago, and this led to the idea of the expanding universe. Later, in 1965, a radio telescope in New Jersey revealed that the whole universe 
even the apparently empty parts of the sky were aglow with radio emission. This is apparently left over from the birth of the universe. It's this particular discovery that makes the Big Bang theory the dominant theory of cosmology at the present time. Einstein's universe will continue on TLC's Science Frontiers. Einstein's picture was the universe is closed. At least that's what he wrote in the last edition of his book, published in the year of his death, 1955. Today, of course, uh, we don't really know how the evidence is, whether there's enough matter to curve the universe up into closure. But to predict, as Einstein did, the expansion of the universe, and to predict it correctly, and to predict it against all expectation, so fantastic a thing, to my idea, is the greatest prediction that mankind has ever made. And to my mind, gives us more faith than anything that we could have, that someday we'll find how the universe itself came into being. I think it's quite right to have celebrated Einstein out here on the far frontier of Texas because not only is it the site of a major observatory and observatories are going to be where Einstein's theories will have to be tested in the distant future, but also because we have all around us still the, the great frontier of the American West and this symbolizes in a way Einstein's general relativity which is at the far frontier of the human mind. The most beautiful thing that we can experience is the mysterious. It's the only source of true art and science. And he to whom this emotion is a stranger, he who can no longer pause in wonder or stand wrapped in awe, well, he's already half dead. His eyes are shut. It was Einstein's passion to understand the universe. For him, that understanding was the only real power. And he did more to create it than any other man who's ever lived. Well, that's a, that's a very large claim, and I'm sure you're right. But would you agree with that, Well, Yes, astronomers use Einstein's ideas all the time, often without remembering who thought of them. It's the ultimate distinction in science to be part of the furniture, like Newton. <laughs> You ask me if one can eventually express everything in scientific terms. Yes, it's possible, but it is useless. It is as though one were to reproduce Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in the shape of an air pressure curve. I propose toast to Albert Einstein, one of our greatest heroes. The musicians have Mozart, Beethoven, and we have Newton and Einstein. And it's appropriate that most of our talk has been about his physics, but we shouldn't forget the other side. Albert Einstein, the folk hero. Though widely honored, he was a simple man who spurned and shunned wealth, power, status. A refugee on the run from Hitler, he was a dignified and gentle symbol of scientific inspiration that was a great particular inspiration for young refugees and immigrants interested in science. The reputed grandfather of the atom bomb, he was the moral leader of the efforts to bring that dangerous and deadly application of E equal MC squared under international control. I propose a toast to the memory of Albert Einstein. To Albert Einstein. The most daring proposition in relativity is that the laws of nature must remain the same at all places and at all times, even in galaxies so far away 
that their light has traveled for thousands of millions of years to reach us. If so, Albert Einstein's own laws of nature conceived with pen and paper on the planet Earth hold good everywhere. What really interests me is whether God had any choice in the creation of the world. Percival Lowell was on an urgent mission for astronomy. Percival Lowell, one of the Lowells of Massachusetts, one of the forever wealthy, Harvard-educated, a brilliant mathematician. Lowell was headed west on a mission he had created, a mission he was paying for, a mission he had assigned to himself. As his train steamed west across the face of planet Earth, 62 and a half million miles away, the planet Mars was rushing towards Percival Lowell. Mars would soon be in opposition, the closest it comes to Earth. An opportune time for Lowell to fulfill his mission, to find life on the mysterious red planet. Earlier that winter, Lowell had dispatched an assistant to Arizona Territory. His orders, to find the best place for seeing, a term astronomers still use to describe the clarity of the atmosphere. From the clear mountain air of Flagstaff, the assistant wired home for the 11th time. This was it. Percival Lowell had found his spot. Lowell talked Harvard University into lending him a telescope, which he promptly had shipped to the Arizona frontier. During that summer of 1894, the eager amateur indulged his obsession, learning the night sky drawing over a thousand sketches of Mars. Mars is not a dead body. On the contrary, its features are in a continual state of change. The appearance of the planet does not remain the same day after day, or even hour after hour. The wealthy Easterner charmed the people of Flagstaff, so they gave him five acres of land above town. He named it Mars Hill. The pioneering townsfolk hoped Lowell's observatory would bring them riches and renown. What the observatory did attract was more pioneers. Pioneers of space and time.
1994. 100 years of seeing. It has been a momentous century for astronomy. A new planet discovered, the origin of the universe, the Big Bang Theory proposed. Men bounding across the surface of the moon. A cosmic collision witnessed for the first time in recorded history. The Lowell Observatory has played a direct role in many of those events, so its 100th birthday was cause for celebration. <laughs> Much of the talk was about the century's biggest show in the solar system, a comet crashing into Jupiter. Among those present were the comet's co-discoverers, Jean and Caroline Shoemaker. Jean worked until recently for the U.S. Geological Survey and has now joined the staff at Lowell. Well, Lowell is a very special place. You have uh, great freedom uh, to carry out scientific research so long as the funds can be found for it. And it has a tradition, of course, from the very beginning uh, of a focus in planetary science. So it carries on a tradition that goes all the way back 100 years to its founding with Percival Lowell. From the very beginning, Percival Lowell gave more than money to the observatory that bears his name. He gave his soul and his passion for the stars and the planets. Wait till the sun sinks behind the hills. Then, as half-light deepens, the universe appears, and one by one the company of heaven stand forth to human sight. If night discloses glimpses of the great beyond, knowledge invests it with a meaning unfolding and extending as acquaintance grows. Lowell's enthusiasm did not endear him to the astronomical community. Many were appalled by his theories about Mars. They dismissed him as a crank, nothing more than a meddling aristocrat. Over time, the scientific world has changed its tune. Leading astronomer Carl Sagan. If Lowell Observatory hadn't been founded, then a whole set of important discoveries, the expansion of the universe, the discovery of Pluto, uh, the early measurements of the temperatures of planets, the setting of the stage for the survey of uh, white dwarfs through the galaxy, the most common end state in the evolution of stars, all that would not have been done. So uh, however grumpy you want to be about uh, Percival Lowell's personality, the actual fact is, that uh, world astronomy is in his debt. Percival Lowell could have done anything, or he could have done nothing. Instead, he chose to found a little observatory on the edge of Western civilization, an outpost of American astronomy just south of the Grand Canyon. Indians arrived in this region 12,000 years ago. Dinosaurs walked the land 200 million years ago. Here, our molten planet began to cool and harden into rock some two billion years ago. The Grand Canyon is a grand place to contemplate ancient events see back across the millennia by looking down at layers of rock or by looking up. Stargazing, reading time in space. A supernova exploded in this part of the night sky 11 million years ago. Since that time, the energy wave, in the form of light, has been hurtling towards Earth. Eleven million light years. A lot has happened between then and now.
1993J, like other recent supernovas, provides a burst of new information about the makeup of the universe to Lowell astronomers. Now, this is the image of the supernova we just got, a type 2 supernovae uh, uh, responsible for the chemical enrichment uh, of the galaxy, the sort of star stuff that uh, we're all made of. Star stuff, black holes, infinity, revealed through these wonderful instruments, telescopes. The basic telescope hasn't changed much over the decades. What has changed is the eye looking through it. The human eye was replaced by more sensitive photographic plates. Now there is the digital chip, a hundred times more sensitive still, capable of receiving a staggering amount of data. In spite of such innovation, basic questions about the universe still remain. The same questions Percival Lowell asked. How big is it? How old is it? What is it made of? Is there life out there? A century after Lowell came west, staff astronomers like John Holtzman still gaze up into the night their minds engaged in what Lowell called far wanderings. It's actually kind of interesting question to ask what's the farthest thing you could see because astronomy is sort of peculiar in that respect because since the distances are so vast and since the light does not reach us instantaneously, as you look further and further away, you're looking further and further back in time. So really astronomy is kind of the cool situation where you don't have to infer from what you see at the present time what things were like long ago. You can actually look and see long ago if you look far and farther away. The most distant and oldest view of the universe yet is this computer-enhanced image of microwave energy taken by a satellite. The microwave spectrum gives astronomers a view of events not millions, but billions of years in the past. In the microwave uh, sky, you're looking back to the universe that existed very long ago when it was much smoother, and there were just very tiny lumps in the matter distribution, which by our current theories, we think those lumps grew by gravity to form into the galaxies and clusters that we see today. Will we eventually be able to see the actual birth of the universe? Close to the beginning, not quite the beginning, but close to the beginning. At the very early universe, the universe was opaque, so you can't see back to the beginning because you can't see through the early universe. Before astronomers can confront the beginning, they must first devise ways to see more clearly up through our own thick atmosphere. Twinkle, twinkle, little star may be fine for children, but the thick blanket of turbulent air that causes the twinkling makes precise seeing all but impossible. That might change soon. I'm reflecting the light from the sun back into this part of the system here. The observatory is building a new version of an old favorite, the most powerful instrument yet for seeing, a giant interferometer. This hybrid telescope is being built at Lowell's second site, a mesa south of Mars Hill, far from the light pollution of Flagstaff. Staff astronomer, Nat White. We'll be able to see the surfaces of the nearby stars. The only star that we've ever seen the surface of in any detail is the sun. How would you like to make a judgment on the whole human race based on looking at one person? For us, that's opening a whole new vista, a whole new range of observations and a whole new possibility in trying to understand the universe. Mirrors will be spread across a site twice the size of a football field. These mirrors don't magnify, as do mirrors found in telescopes. Instead, being optically flat, they reflect a true image. 
starlight collected from six of these mirrors will be directed down a complex web of vacuum pipes to a central mirror room. When the beams are combined, as in this laser test, they interfere with each other, creating patterns. With actual starlight streaming through the system, the patterns will yield precise information about stars hundreds of light years away. To achieve such precision, the interferometer has to be steady, rock steady. We're standing on about 50 feet of solid basalt, 8 million years old. And on top of that, we've poured over 900 cubic yards of concrete. And the object is uh, stability of our mirrors. When the instrument is all together and the mirrors are on, we'll be able to measure the Earth's surface rise and fall as the moon passes overhead. And that amount of motion would be of the order of some small fraction of a human hair. When completed, the Lowell interferometer will be a generation beyond the Hubble Space Telescope. Construction is being funded by the Navy. They will use it to refine star charts and improve navigation. Observatory astronomers will have many uses for their new device. One of the first will be an attempt to detect new planetary systems. The photons coming through these mirrors could carry the information that there is another solar system out there, another planetary system around a distant star. Such a discovery would be a big step towards Percival Lowell's dream, the confirmation of intelligent life out there. This presentation of Stargazers is sponsored in part by Mercedes-Benz and Merrill Lynch. During Lowell's stays in Arizona, he lived in a house of his own design on Mars Hill, nicknamed the Baronial Mansion. Please see that the wildflowers on Mars Hill are never picked. Put up notices. At Christmas, he put on a beard and costume, playing Santa Claus for the pioneers, scientific and otherwise, who had come to live on the Arizona frontier. Percival Lowell was almost 40 when he built his observatory. But the night skies had fascinated him since he was three years old. Consciously, I came into this world with a comet. Donati's Comet of 1858 being my earliest recollection. And I can see yet a small boy, halfway up a turning staircase, gazing with all his soul into the evening sky where that stranger stood. As the boy grew, so did his inquisitiveness. Still, astronomy remained a hobby. Not until he was in his 30s did Lowell become truly focused on the planets and on extraterrestrial life. That we are the only part of the cosmos possessing what we are pleased to call a mind is so Earth-centered a supposition that it recalls the other Earth-centered view once so devoutly held that our little globe was the point about which the whole company of heaven was good enough to turn. Robert Millis is the observatory's director. Well, there is absolutely no question that Percival Lowell founded the Lowell Observatory to pursue his ideas about the possibility of intelligent life on Mars. The telescope presents us with perhaps the most startling discovery of modern times, the so-called canals of Mars. If, therefore, the planet possesses inhabitants, there is but one course open to them to support life, irrigation, and upon as vast a scale as possible. Lowell had read the works of an Italian astronomer who thought he had seen web-like lines on Mars' surface. Giovanni Schiaparelli called them canali, which in Italian means grooves or lines. 
Percival Lowell became convinced they actually were canals. He went into the investigation believing that the lines were there. And given that predisposition, he began to see them. And over time, he saw more of them. And the more Lowell saw, the more sure he became that they had been built by intelligent beings. Darwin's profound new theory of evolution dominated thought at the turn of the century, and Lowell saw no reason why life wouldn't have evolved on other planets. In fact, he assumed it to be inevitable. And thus began the myth of life on Mars. Given that he met with skepticism from the astronomical community and a fair amount of uh, sensationalism from the uh, popular press, first of all, Lowell sort of took his case to the people. He wrote a number of books that were quite popular. The press had a field day. Newspaper artists used gallons of ink, drawing wildly imaginative visions of life on Mars. And the public couldn't get enough of it. Not until 1976, when the Viking lander touched down on Mars, was Percival Lowell's theory conclusively disproved. Even the Martian Canal business, where he was dead wrong, had some most interesting consequences. One consequence was that uh, when Lowell gave a set of lectures at MIT on the canals, there was a teenage boy from Worcester, Massachusetts, who. Uh, attended. His name was Robert Goddard. And that set of lectures moved Goddard to decide that he would devise a means of going to Mars. And he turned out to be the inventor of the liquid fuel rocket. And uh, in fact, the uh, spacecraft that observe Mars today are the direct descendants of what uh, Percival Lowell did via Robert Goddard. The public interest in life on Mars soon waned. The controversy left a stigma on the observatory and clouded Lowell's reputation in astronomy. Perhaps in an effort to overcome this perception, he pushed his staff to continue with other research. At that time, it was a common belief that our Milky Way galaxy was the sum total of the universe. What were, in fact, other galaxies were thought at the turn of the century to be young solar systems. Lowell assigned one of his staff, Vesto Melvin Slipher, to study the spiral shapes with a spectrograph, an instrument that uses a prism to break up light from stars and reveal their chemical makeup. The spectral light was very faint and that meant long exposures, sometimes over several consecutive nights. But Slipher was a patient man. He would sit there in the dome, in the dark, in the cold, all night long, carefully guiding the telescope to stay exactly on the object uh, he was interested in. It was miserable, tedious work. The outcome was that for many of these objects, he discovered the totally unexpected result that the spectral lines were nowhere near where they should have been in the spectrum, but in fact were shifted tremendously to the red. Well, it was ultimately realized that these shifts were due to the fact that these objects were fleeing away from us. This amazing finding, called the red shift, was to have far-reaching results. Astronomer Edwin Hubble combined V.M. Slipher's spectral discovery with his own research and came up with a startling conclusion. The whole universe was expanding. Later, that concept would fundamentally change the way we perceive the universe by leading to the Big Bang Theory. The Lowell Observatory's early role in the Big Bang Theory received little notice at the time. It was another discovery that brought world attention to Mars Hill. 
the search for planet X. Percival Lowell had spent several years analyzing the orbits of the outer planets. He thought he detected irregularities that might indicate a ninth planet even farther out. Finding Planet X became Lowell's second great obsession. He organized a search that would last 25 years, a search he would not live to see completed. The obsession came to be shared by a young man named Clyde Tombaugh, hired by the observatory in 1929. Though Tomba left Lowell 50 years ago, time has not dimmed his memories of a seemingly endless search, scanning literally billions and billions of stars. He worked from photographs, black dots against white, negative star images on glass plates. You get cold, you get numb, there's a lot of perseverance, because this gets brutally monotonous. Tomba spent over 7,000 hours searching for a distant planet and other objects at this machine, a Zeiss Blink comparator. It enabled the operator to flip the view between two star plates taken months or years apart. If anything appeared to move, Tomba would repeat the blink. It might be an asteroid, or a comet, or lint, or an undiscovered planet. So I delayed the night, but the only thing you get was the Mex station in Mexico. So I listened to a lot of Mexican music. <laughs> Gave me something to think about and listen to. Uh, just sitting there looking at the bed, that's mighty monotonous of hour by hour. Tomba had been raised on a farm in Kansas, where he built his own telescope at the age of 12. He still uses it in his backyard. This is the, an old cream separator mount from my pedestal. And uh, this is a quarter axis here. It's a small shaft off of my dad's old 1910 Buick. I was seven miles away from a small town. I had no light pollution whatever. Astronomy was enlarging my horizon. Realize how the world's out there, you see. Tomba drew pictures of the planets and on a whim sent them off to the Lowell Observatory. But couldn't anyone have copied planets out of a book? The planets are never exactly the same twice. And if you copied them from some previous drawing, they'd find it out. And then you'd, and then, uh, and then you'd be uh, accused of uh, stealing. Now that, that uh, you can't fudge a planet. Clyde Tomba was lucky. His drawings arrived about the same time that the observatory had decided to redouble its efforts to find planet X. I, I saw well and I drew accurately. And they were impressed, so they offered me a job. At Lowell, Tomba dove into the task, shooting new star plates at night and blinking the plates during the day. Then, on February 18, 1930, at 4 p.m., Clyde spotted a faint flicker. A speck had moved as he blinked between the two plates. Now he got the right place about near the, where the star is, and it turns in there it was. Exactly what I expected to see. I knew instantly it was far beyond the orbit of Neptune. I knew it instantly. What to name this new discovery? Such names as Apollo, Bacchus and Zeus were considered. At one point, someone suggested naming it after Clyde. Two months later, it was settled. The new planet would be named Pluto. The first two letters were P-L, as in Percival Lowell. But Percival Lowell missed the world attention and renown that the discovery of Pluto finally brought to his observatory. 
He had died suddenly of a stroke in 1916. Lowell the astronomer was buried not in Boston, but here on the Arizona hilltop where his dreams had led him. Withdrawn from contact, the astronomer is much raised above human prejudice and limitation. To sally forth on a winter's night with the frosty stars for mute companionship is almost to forget oneself a man for the solemn awe of one's surroundings. A fitting portal to another world. Eighty years after Percival Lowell's death, the goals of astronomy have not changed a great deal. What has changed are the tools. Percival Lowell, and after him, Clyde Tombaugh, did things the hard way. I don't think anyone would probably dedicate their lives the way that Clyde did to scanning plates manually by eye. We've got a lot more powerful tools at our disposal, namely fast computers and digital detectors. Like Tombaugh, Lowell astronomer Mark Bowie is fixated on Pluto. Oh, I've been doing Pluto since the first years in graduate school. Um, at that time, very little was known about it, and uh, it looked like an interesting project. And as soon as I started working with it, it just completely absorbed all of my waking thoughts and some of my non-waking ones as well. The planet remains a mystery. In spite of the recent advances in telescope technology, Pluto has never been resolved as anything more than a dim point of light. So how was Mark Bowie able to create a map of Pluto's surface? His clever techniques reveal a lot about the way astronomy is conducted today, by squeezing maximum information from the most meager data. Bowie and his associates began not by trying to capture an image of the distant planet. That was impossible, as it's only a point of light but they could measure and record the changing intensity of that light as Pluto was eclipsed by its satellite moon, Charon, and Charon, accordingly, was eclipsed by Pluto. Every three and a half days, um, either the planet would pass in front of the satellite or the satellite would pass in front of the planet and blocking portions of the surface from view. For six years, Bowie's team measured the variations in light then created this computer rendering of the alternating eclipses. As Pluto and Charon alternately obscured each other, changes in the reflected light patterns created a kind of scan, revealing information about surface characteristics of the two bodies. By collecting all of these scans across Pluto, we can put it into the computer, and generate maps. The map, as incredible as it is, only shows the light and dark areas on Pluto and Charon. But it will have to do until a space probe can be launched. I think we're entering in a new era, well, at least I hope we are in this country, of saying, you know, we should be doing exploration because we want to do exploration, not because we're trying to beat somebody. You know, it's not a, a strategic thing, it's just, it's, it's a search for knowledge. How big is the universe? How old is it? Does it contain other life? Does anything out there threaten us? The answer to that last question is yes. When comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 slammed into Jupiter, millions of people got a preview of what could happen to Earth. If you can capture the flash of the initial entry meteor, that was one way we could determine the actual moment of entry into the atmosphere. Jupiter is telling us, in my view... Gene Shoemaker's wife, Carolyn, was the first on the team to spot the strange comet. 
more than a year before the final impact. Carolyn holds the world's record for discovering new comets, and she only started looking at age 53. The first feeling I had is a feeling that I get with every comet. I, I get a real high, it's a real thrill of joy. Uh, here's something that no one else has seen. It surprised the shoemakers and their colleagues, this string of pearls comet. But there would be bigger surprises. For instance, the orbit. Comets usually swing around our sun. That was a complete <laughs> surprise. It's the first time ever a comet has been discovered in orbit around a planet. So that was uh, surprise number two. And finally, about two months later, then it became evident that it might hit Jupiter. Uh, and so that was surprise number three. This will be for our school district so that all the kids can see it. So surprise number four, the shoemakers were instant celebrities. Not just for me. <laughs> As the comet chunks continued to blow holes bigger than the Earth in Jupiter's atmosphere, people began to wonder about our own planet. What would happen if a comet fell on us? And something like that hitting the Earth is getting up into the range that it would produce a global catastrophe, uh, a, a very potential mass extinction of species on the Earth, so it would be really bad. The shoemakers have joined a Lowell Observatory project investigating this very threat. They're searching for dangerous asteroids and comets that might be headed our way. This steel pillar will anchor a telescope for a pilot project that could save the lives of 5.6 billion of us, the entire human race. Lowell astronomer Ted Bowl is the principal investigator. For the first time in the development of society, we are faced with a situation, a threat, if you wish, from outer space that we can do something about. It is now a generally accepted theory that the age of the dinosaurs ended abruptly with the cataclysmic impact of an asteroid 10 miles in diameter. So Chicken Little may have been right after all. Some astronomers speculate an even larger collision tore off a chunk which became our moon. Compared to the moon and most other bodies in the solar system, the Earth shows relatively few impact sites. There are two reasons. One, most fall into our vast oceans, and two, erosion. One of the few we can see is 35 miles east of the Lowell Observatory. In the long course of history, many craters of this size must have appeared on Earth and then been eroded away by weathering and the wind and the rain. A crater of this size, caused by a body maybe a hundred feet across, occurs on Earth once every ten to a hundred thousand years. This crater was created some 50,000 years ago by a meteorite of solid metal traveling at 34,000 miles per hour. It was equivalent of something like a detonation of a 20 megaton nuclear device. A very large explosion indeed. Three to four billion years ago, our young solar system was a war zone of swirling debris. New craters appeared frequently on planets and their moons. Now that debris has settled down, forming a ring that orbits the sun between Mars and Jupiter. This ring is the main asteroid belt. If we, in a spaceship, leave Jupiter and its moons and travel 250 million miles away to the main asteroid belt, we will still be under the gravitational influence of the great red planet. So are the asteroids. Most of these, 99.9% .9 of them, are locked in eternal orbit around the sun, 
and pose no threat to us. But there are a few far wanderers, rogues that are not harmless and whose erratic behavior could prove to be catastrophic. And these rogue asteroids that come near the Earth are driven into near-Earth space by the immense gravitational tug of Jupiter. Rogue asteroids move into their own elliptical orbits, which repeatedly cross the path of our own planet. Over the next million years, or 100,000 years, or even the next few centuries, there will be a series of near misses. But eventually, there will be a final rendezvous. Much of the material uh, in, near, near the explosion would be vaporized and thrown out of, uh, from the Earth's surface. When it hit the ground, it would burn everything that it touched, and so forest fires would get set off all over the Earth. There is an additional huge amount of dust from the explosion of the impacting asteroid, so the sun's light would go out at least for several months, and some people think for, for some years. So it will be blacker than the darkest night that we can experience. Fortunately for us, uh, impacts of that kind probably occur not more than once every hundred million years. And so the probability of, of us experiencing such an impact is, is very small indeed. But our civilization could also be severely stressed by much smaller events. Almost any size asteroid is a potential killer. The Arizona crater was caused by an object the size of a commercial airliner, but it would have killed everybody within a 20-mile radius. Finding rogue asteroids is no easy task. Hey, that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. For the time being, Lowell astronomers use labor-intensive scanning systems. These will soon be replaced by a computer version of Clyde Tombaugh and his blinking machine, an early warning system that continuously compares one electronic snapshot with the next, looking for anomalies. And we will scan the sky quite quickly, so we'll cover an area like this in, in just a few minutes. What can be done if they actually find a lethal asteroid hurtling our way? One suggestion has been made, fire off a massive nuclear warhead. An iffy proposition, at best. To deviate an asteroid in its orbit is a difficult technological thing to do. The way you would do that is to set off a nuclear device somewhere near the asteroid's surface. Now, you don't want to set off such a device at the asteroid's surface because that would almost certainly cause the asteroid to fragment and being hit by a very large number of fragments might actually be worse than being hit by one single body. Uh, so that is a job for nuclear scientists, and as you can imagine, it raises all kinds of uh, possible political and sociological problems. Problems that are beyond the scope of the Lowell Observatory. Here the concerns are astral, not Earth. That is what Percival Lowell intended, and that is the way it remains. Astronomy now demands bodily abstraction of its devotee. To see into the beyond requires purity, and the securing of it makes the astronomer perforce a hermit from his kind. He must abandon cities and forego plains. 
Only in the places raised above and aloof from men can he profitably pursue his search. Percival Lowell was a visionary, a brilliant mathematician with a soaring imagination, a frontiersman. He left a permanent stamp on modern astronomy. It is called the Lowell Observatory. The people at Lowell today continue to search the night skies, reaching beyond what we know. Stargazers inspired by the man from Massachusetts with a dream. You just need to be sort of be curious about what's going on out there. It's probably not going to directly impact your life in any revolutionary way, but it's interesting. Curiosity is what uh, motivates a lot of us to live our lives, and uh, it's certainly a worthwhile endeavor in and of itself. There's a beautiful poem that's written by a colleague of mine, and one of the thrusts of this poem was that, yes, men may go to the moon, may go to Mars, and we'll be exploring but they'll find the footprints of our minds there before we get there. We're the real pioneers in trying to figure these places out, and it's more of a mental journey, but it's a journey nonetheless. And that's what drives us from day to day. We are actually the progeny of comets. Comets delivered the water, the carbon, the nitrogen, the things out of which living organisms are formed and provided the watery environment in which life could evolve. So if you, when you see that comet out there in the sky, you can say, hi, Grandpa, or <laughs> hi, cousin. <laughs> Imagination is as vital to any advance in science as learning and precision are essential for starting points. Let me warn you to beware of two opposite errors of letting your imagination soar unballasted by fact, but on the other hand, of shackling it so solidly that it loses all incentive to rise. is part of the Discovery Signature Series. The Discovery Channel and the Chrysler Corporation are proud to bring you the best in quality documentary television. This presentation of The Brain is presented in partnership with Chrysler Plymouth and Jeep Eagle, divisions of the Chrysler Corporation. <laughs>